Okay, last time that we were talking about the income statement, we were talking about below the line items. Um, the first below the line item I introduced you guys to was the discontinued operation and the disclosure involved with that. Now we're gonna move into comprehensive income, but before we hit comprehensive income, it's worth revisiting earnings per share. Earnings per share, these are required disclosure that every company has to make on its income statement. And it's extremely important. It is widely reported in the press. It is the uh, metric against which earnings targets are uh, measured by analysts. Typically, they forecast a company's earnings and earnings per share. And that's the target that management tries to hit. We'll talk a little bit more about that in lecture in terms of earnings incentives and manipulating earnings from a managerial perspective. Um, the basic EPS calculation is net income less preferred dividends divided by weighted average common shares outstanding. Um, you'll talk more about this and different derivations of EPS in Intermediate 2, but this will suffice for our definition by now. Um, weighted average is just a adjusted average uh, with consideration that, for example, if you had 80,000 shares at the beginning of the year and 100,000 at the end, it's not the case that unless you offered a hundred thousand dollars, I'm sorry, if you offered 20,000 more shares in the middle of the year, that the, that the true average would be 90,000. For example, you might not have issued those shares until December, um, in which case it would, the average would be more weighted toward 80 than 100 because there was only one month in which you had a hundred thousand outstanding. Um, but don't worry about calculating it. I'll just give you the weighted average common shares outstanding for these problems. One thing you will have to consider is that there will either be one or three, one or three EPS figures disclosed. And that depends on whether or not there are discontinued operations. If there are discontinued operations, um, then you will have to disclose all three numbers. If there are no discontinued operations, then you will only have net income. This is pretty apparent because without discontinued operations, you can't have income from continuing operations, nor could you have an effect of discontinued operations. Notice too that when you're looking at these EPS figures, um, net income is differently defined. So in the first one, income from continuing operations represents our net income number and we would include the effect of preferred dividends as we see in our formula here. When we are talking about the effect of discontinued operations, the effect of discontinued operations is just the profit or loss and the gain or loss from disposal. So there's a big difference in these two, which are subtotals, net income and income from continuing operations, and this item, which is a subtotal of only two things, but not everything that comes before, right? It doesn't include all the income from continuing operations. It just contains profit and loss, gain or loss. Now, net income will include income from continuing operations, any profits or losses from the gain or loss from disposal, and hence we would want to include the effect of preferred dividends. Um, the more sophisticated measures that you'll learn to calculate are what we call diluted uh, EPS. And diluted EPS is a projection of a worst case scenario that calculates EPS figures as if um, all convertible uh, shares, all convertible debt had been uh, converted into shares of common stock. Okay, so that's basic, basically our EPS um, highlight for this chapter. Know how many you have to calculate, know how to calculate these three, what goes in them, and um, be able to apply this formula. Right. Um, comprehensive income is the next below the line item. Honestly, comprehensive income is the final stop on the income statement. It is below net income. And, you know, we almost train you to think there's absolutely nothing that could become below net income. And the honest truth is that there's nothing relevant that comes below net income. Comprehensive income is net income, everything from sales to discontinued operations, plus other comprehensive income items. These other comprehensive income items, um, it's basically a, a, an area of the income statement that represents a holding ground for gains and losses that will be included in net income at a later date. 
Okay. So there's a lot of things in accounting we don't put into net income right away. And the idea behind that is that we don't want to induce uh, volatility in our earnings, in our net income measure. Now, I say we don't want to do some vol volatility, but we don't want to in induce irrelevant or unnecessary, right? It's not like we're trying to avoid or you know, hide something from the investors. We do like smooth income. However, these are just items that don't necessarily have a uh, current period relevancy uh, to the, the shareholders. And quite honestly, we're not sure when they will. So let's look at some of the items that are in there. Um, we have unrealized gains or losses on available for sale securities. If you recall, those available for sale securities is a class of investment that is um, classified on the intentions of management. Translation gains or losses on foreign currency. So if the firm holds some foreign currency investments and the dollar strengthens versus that foreign currency, we would have a loss because the, the exchange value of that currency dropped, or if that exchange currency rose against the dollar, then there would be a gain on those foreign investments. Um, additional pension liability over unrecognized prior service costs, that's something that'll make a lot more sense in intermediate too. Um, unrealized gains or losses on cash flow hedging transactions, that'll make a lot more sense in advanced accounting. Um, cash flow hedging transactions are just a way to mitigate risk on certain transactions, and it has to meet a few criteria to be, to be determined to be a cash flow hedge. Uh, and that's again something that is uh, a rather uh, detailed and advanced topic in accounting. But those are the, the usual suspects that we see, and so there's not a whole lot. And also we see that they're not really indicative of the firm's ability. Uh, these are sort of arbitrary macroeconomic factors in a way. Um, you know, and so are the cash flow hedges. The unreal, the, this one, the excess additional pension liability is very much just a don't want to induce unnecessary irrelevant volatility and it is included slowly. It's almost like depreciation expense where we don't expense everything at once, we, we include it slowly in that income, okay? And these others have different items. Usually it's when they're realized, not just when, they, when they're unrealized. Uh, the presentation on the balance sheet. So these things do mirror over to the balance sheet. Remember, there is an account called accumulated other comprehensive income. This is a lot like retained earnings, right? So that's what I want you to think about. If um, net in if all the items from you know sales all the way down to net income, right? Remember, all of this stuff up here contributes to net income. All those gains, losses, revenues, expenses. And then we take net income and close it to retained earnings. Well, if we have comprehensive income, which is below net income, right, all of these items then that contribute to comprehensive income are going to be closed to accumulated other comprehensive income. And so just like retained earnings, it can have a uh, debit or credit balance if we close a bunch of losses, um, if these are a bunch of loss accounts, then if they're closed over, they could lead to a debit balance in AOCI. Um, so that's just like retained earnings in that um, regard. Okay. So I've just sort of continued the balance sheet from prior chapter. Again, notice that uh, you know EPS figures would be drawn off of that subtotal, this subtotal, and this subtotal, this one would be minus preferred dividends, this one would be minus preferred dividends, this one would not be, and they would all be divided by um, weighted average shares outstanding. Notice that we don't have an EPS for comprehensive income either. Also, because it's below the line, this receives the same treatment net of tax as does the discontinued operations because it falls beneath the tax expense line. So let's look at some items here that um, could occur. Big Data Corp has the following items that classify as comprehensive effects for the year, and all these are pre-tax. If Big Data had net income of 1,730 and a beginning debit balance of 130,000 and it's accumulated at the comprehensive income, provide comprehensive income and the ending balance of accumulated. 
So we would start then, you know, if we just want to replicate what I have above, we would have net income of $1,730,000. And that, of course, is net of tax. Um, now we have the unrealized loss. And again, what an unrealized loss means is that we haven't sold them yet. So the market went down and they lost value, but we just haven't sold them. So if we're going to net that of tax, we would want to take 127 and multiply it by the after-tax tax rate. I didn't tell you a tax rate, and here's an important lesson, especially when you're taking tests. If Strasser doesn't tell you a tax rate, then what he wants you to assume is a 40% tax rate, okay? That's my CYA. I don't always remember to give you a tax rate. Um, so that's a loss, and that would be $76.2,000. Um, an unrealized loss on cash flow hedges, so I'm just gonna do ditto marks. Obviously, um, you couldn't do ditto marks on a official balance sheet, but they save time here. And that unrealized loss on the net of uh, the cash flow hedges would be 154 times 0. 0.6, which comes out to 92,400. And then we had a foreign translation gain. And again, remember that net of tax is necessary um, and it needs to be there because that is a disclosure requirement. That's not like ditto marks. You can't just leave that one off, right? So then we just total these guys up, 173 plus 76.2, oops, sorry, minus, oops. I get one that one million six hundred six thousand four hundred. That would be my comprehensive income. Now the question also asks me to balance out my AOCI account. I said that the AOCI account began with a debit balance of one hundred thirty thousand. Well, remember we would close each of these out, and you want to close them out net of tax. All right. Uh, don't worry about the journal entry. It's a little confusing. It would involve deferred tax assets and liabilities, and I'll talk about those in intermediate two. But this would, this loss would be credited, which would debit AOCI. Same thing for the loss on the cash flow hedge, and the gain on the foreign translation would come in as a credit. So my new AOCI balance would be just those numbers, 130 plus 76.2 plus 92.4 minus 45 gives me an overall debit balance of 253,000, sorry about that, 253,600 dollars. And that would be my overall uh, accumulated other compensative income, okay. <clears throat> The final item I want to talk about is this unofficial statement of retained earnings. And remember that this is just really a partial shareholder's equity statement. Um, it is not an official statement. It is something we're using for the sake of this class because we're going to talk about some irregularities in accounting um, that require a statement of retained earnings to understand where they fit in. Uh, then you'll cover the rest of the shareholder's equity statement in intermediate two. So um, some things we're gonna add. Now remember, we came first with this idea that it's retained earnings uh, equals retained earnings beginning plus net income less dividends, which is true. Now we're gonna add just two more things to it. One is called a retrospective adjustment from changes in accounting principles, net of tax. For now, we're gonna talk about that in the next, um, the next lecture, the next part of these notes down here. But assume that, for example, we're changing from LIFO to FIFO. Well, that would be a change in accounting principle, right? A change in revenue recognition. 
techniques would be a change in accounting principle. So we adjust for that. If the firm changes in this year, we have to make a lot of adjustments in prior years and bring them forward and then adjust the statement of retained earnings. Another thing that goes in here are prior period adjustments, corrections of errors. We've already seen, you know, an example of what can happen whenever you don't adjust the adjusting entries appropriately. Um, if you forget to make an adjusting entry or anything happens, we make that discovery um, in a particular year whenever we made the error. So say we made the error five years ago, it doesn't matter. We still put that error in this year's retained earnings. That's how we adjust for it. Of course, dividends and net income. And then any restrictions on retained earnings are also noted. So remember there's appropriated and unappropriated. Uh, and remember that that means that if they are appropriated, they cannot be paid out as dividends. If they are unappropriated, then they are free to be paid as dividends. Um, and that would conclude the differences that we have. So what we have then really is beginning retained earnings plus or minus these two adjustments, the cumulative change in accounting principles and the discovery of an error or the correction of an error. Those two give me an adjusted beginning balance. So I'm adjusting for things that went awry in prior years or changed in the current year and now we had to go back and change. Um, and then we recognize any net income or loss, subtract any dividends that are declared, and then that gives me my ending retained earnings. And that's it for this video. I told you they're getting shorter, and I hope to stay on this sort of pace so that they're not quite as lengthy and cumbersome. And we will pick up with accounting regularities in the next section of these notes.